This is Dr. Madhuri from Team MDS Conquer. Now I am going to discuss about uh, the thrombosis in this video. So if you see in our, in our body there is an inbuilt system. So this inbuilt system will help us to help, help the blood in our body to remain in the fluid state only. Otherwise the blood if you take outside from our body it will clot. Okay, But inside the body there is an inbuilt system to make the blood to stay in the fluid state only it is a normal mechanism in our body and there is a thing there is a process called as thrombosis and this thrombosis means the formation of a solid mass in the circulation and this solid mass in the circulation which is formed from the constant of fluid flowing blood is called as a thrombus solid mass is called as a thrombus where this process entire process is called as a thrombosis so to prevent or to i mean like to prevent this thrombosis there are few inbuilt mechanisms in our body and we'll see few factors which are responsible for the thrombosis so if you see here the endothelial injury platelets altered blood flow hypercoagulability state and coagulation system all these factors will have an ethological role in the formation of the thrombus and there are th primary events three primary events which was given by the virtue and the three primary events which predispose the thrombus formation these are the three events which predispose the thrombus formation which is called as a virtual stride and this includes hypercoagulability state stasis of the blood and a vessel wall injury so these three vessel wall or endothelial injury altered blood flow or a stasis of blood or a hypercoagulability of blood all these three includes the virtuous trite now we'll see the each uh, predisposing factor in detail first we see with the endothelial injury okay actually uh, in an intact endothelium has many functions if the endothelium is intact so this intact endothelium will protect the flowing blood from the formation of the thrombus and it has the antithrombotic factors the antithrombotic factors that will inhibit the thrombosis like heparin like substances which will accelerate the antithrombin 3 thrombomodulin which will convert thrombin into activator of protein c and anticoagulant so this protein c is anticoagulant so this thrombomodulin will convert the thrombin into the activator of protein c and inhibitors of platelet aggregation such as adpas and pgi2 or prostacyclin and the tissue plasminogen activator which accelerates the fibrinolytic that means it will have a clot lysis activity so these are the important protective mechanisms which prevent the thrombus formation which is seen in the intact endothelium and and there are new few prothrombin factors are also which are uh, released by the procoagulant properties okay they are thromboplastin von willebrand factor and platelet activating factor so this thromboplastin will uh, be released from the endothelial cells and von Willebrand factor will cause the aberrance of the platelets and platelet activating factor which is the activator and aggregator of platelets. These are the prothrombic thrombotic factors and in the previous slide you have seen the antithrombotic factors. So this diagram defect depicts this thing. So usually if the intact, endo, intact endothelium is there it will prevent the thrombosis formation but if there is any endothelial injury you can see here endothelial injury will expose this subendothelial matrix to the circulating blood and this and exposure of the subendothelial matrix to the circulating blood will initiate the three steps that is adhesion release and aggregation of the platelets and this adhesion release and aggregation of the platelets okay this is the second step and in the third step there is the activation of the coagulation cascade which results in the fibrin strands and the thrombus formation so these are the steps or the events which occurs if there is an endothelial injury so that is the first predisposing factor the second thing is your 
platelet rolls so we i have told that there are three steps in this thing that is platelet addition uh, platelet release action and the platelet aggregation so if you see this platelet addition the important two things are there here to remember one is glycoprotein 1b receptor and the von willebrand factor okay this glycoprotein 1b receptor on the platelets it is present on the platelets and it will recognize the site of endothelial injury remember this point this receptor will recognize the site of endothelial injury whereas von willi willebrand factor will synthesized by the endothelial cells will bind to this gp 1b receptor and forms the firm addition of the platelets if these two will leads to the firm addition of the platelets so that's why if there is any deficiency of von willebrand factor which occurs in the von willebrand disease and or absence of this gp 1b receptor which is seen in bernard solier disease remember this thing gp 1b receptor is absent in bernard solier disease so if these two things are there it results in the abnormal platelet addition which finally leads to the abnormal bleeding so this is regarding the platelet addition and the second step is will be of your platelet release action so this activated platelets will undergo release reaction there are two types of platelet granules released here dense bodies there and this dense bodies liberate the adp that is adenosine diphosphate calcium and the serotonin and histamine this dense bodies will liberate whereas this alpha granules will release is the fibrinogen fibrinonectin and platelet derived platelet derived growth factor and the finally the platelet aggregation it is follow it will i mean like it follows the release of adp and uh, this is because of this which and um, platelet aggregation takes place so this is the role of platelets in the thrombus formation that is platelet addition release action and the platelet aggregation is finally result in the formation of a temporary hemostatic plug then the regulation of the coagulation system so this third predisposing factor will be of your coagulation system here there the protein you can see here the protease inhibitors these will act on the coagulation factor so that they will oppose the formation this will be in the normal state okay in the normal state this in the coagulation system protease inhibitors are present and this protease inhibitors will oppose the formation of thrombin and the example of this protease inhibitors includes anti thrombin 3 and the c1 inactivator and alpha 1 antitrypsin anti thrombin 3 c1 inactivator and alpha 1 antitrypsin are the examples of this protease inhibitors and if you take the fibrinolytic system here the plasmin is a potent plasmin is a potent fibrinolytic enzyme that means it will lyse this it will make the lysis of a clot and here there are two type of plasminogen activators tissue type pa plasminogen activator which are derived from the endothelial cells and the urokinase like uh, plasma plasminogen activator which is present in the plasma so this is the regulation of coagulation system so because of this protease inhibitors and fibrinolytic system a thrombus is not formed in the in the blood normally then you can see here in this diagram so in the normally the this is the blood flow you can see the central stream consists of leukocytes and red cells and the platelets whereas the peripheral stream will be of a plas cell free plasma zone that is cells are absent in the peripheral stream and if you take the when there is a turbulence or a stasis flow this is a normal flow this is a turbulence or a stasis flow all the blood leukocytes red cells and the platelets will be marginating and pavementing to the peripheries okay marginating and pavementing the peripheries which will leads to the formation of a thrombus this is in the normal axial flow and this is in the turbulence or a stasis blood flow then there is a the state called as hypercoagulable state which is very important and this hypercoagulable state is also called as a thrombophilia and there are many reasons for this hypercoagulable states and because of this 
hypercoagulable hyper state there is an increased risk of uh, venous thrombosis okay and this causes includes like inherited inherited or hereditary causes and acquired or a secondary causes if you take the inherited causes this is deficiency of antithrombin 3 and usually mostly this condition is associated with the venous recurrent episodes of venous thrombosis then deficiency of protein c and the deficiency of protein s okay these are the autosomal dominant disorders and mostly associated with the thrombosis of leg veins and mutation in the factor 5 laden this is also a autosomal dominant disorder here the mutation will replace the arginine arginine is replaced by glycine at the position 506 which is very important in the mutation of factor 5 arginine is replaced by the glycine at the 506 position and the most common cause of thrombophilia mutation, mutation in the factor 5 laden is the most common cause of thrombophilia and the defects in the fibrinolysis like this fibrinogenemia and plasminogen disorders and increased levels of coagulation factors like uh, 28 this is due to because of the genetic mutation and predisposed to the thrombosis. Then coming to the acquired secondary factors which leads to the thrombophilia includes advanced age, prolonged bed rest, prolonged immobilization, cigarette smoking and obesity and other predisposing clinical conditions like heart diseases, vascular diseases, hypercoagulable conditions like polycythemia and myeloproliferative disorders, dehydration, shock, tissue damage, late pregnancy and uh, certain drugs like anest anesthetic drugs and oral contraceptives and hormonal replacement, th replacement theory or predisposing clinical conditions. And if you take this, this is a antiphospholipid antibody syndrome which is consists of a lupus anticoagulant antibody and anticardiolipin antibody. Then these are the examples of the I mean like types of thrombi there is uh, one more thrombi called as a cardiac thrombi which can be seen mostly i mean like which can be seen as a vegetative uh, growth on the cardiac and which result in the blood flow mechanical abstraction of the blood flow cardiac thrombi and here comes the arterial thrombi which uh, is seen in the iota origin origin iota there may be of aneurysms and arteritis if the origin is in coronary arteries you can see atherosclerosis, mesenteric artery, arteries of the limbs which includes atherosclerosis, Bioger's disease, Raynaud's disease which are discussed and renal artery will also cause and cerebral artery will, these are the origin of the arterial thrombi and this is the origin of the venous thrombi, the lower leg, popliteal and iliac veins, pulmonary veins, hepatic and portal veins, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava mesenteric veins and renal veins all these are the origin of the venous thrombi and there are also called as capillary thrombi there these are the very minute thrombi which composed mainly of a packed red cells and these are formed in the capillaries in acute inflammatory lesions vasculitis and the disseminated intravascular coagulation and this vasculitis is mostly seen in the autoimmune disorders so those are the origin of the thrombi and here you can see the differences between the arterial and venous thrombi which is very important. Here in arterial thrombi they are formed in rapidly flowing blood whereas venous thrombi formed in slow moving blood. Sites more common in iota and cerebral, iliac, femur, renal and mesenteric arteries. If you see the venous thrombi. These are common in superficial varicose veins or a deep leg veins or a popliteal veins. And the thrombogenesis formed following the endothelial injury. Example of this arterial thrombi will be of your atherosclerosis. And please relate all these things to your arterial and uh, venous disorders in the general surgery. Okay. And this formed in the venous stasis after following the venous stasis. And example include abdominal operations and the childbirth. And development usually mural and not occluding the lumen completely whereas this will be of usually occlusive and macroscopy it will have a white friable with lines of jaw and surface this is very important 
whereas this is red blue with fibrin strands and lines of jan and this in microscopy also there is a distinct lines of jan and here also lines of jan with more abundant red blood cells are seen whereas here this distinct lines of jan consist of platelets fibrin and entangled with red and white blood cells so the difference you can see here the composition of this lines okay this is very important and finally it leads to the ischemia effect where it leads to thromboembolism edema ulcers and poor wound healing then this is the difference between anti mortem thrombi and the post mortem th thrombi in the gross picture you this anti mortem mortem thrombi will be of dry granular whereas this post mortem clots will be of gelatinous soft if it is adherent to the vessel wall and this post mortem clots are weakly attached to the vessel wall shape may or may not fit their vascular contours but here this post mortem clots will take the shape of the vessel and the microscopy it contains apparent lines of jan whereas this is very very important the post mortem clots will have will surface is a chicken fat yellow covering the underlying red currant jelly okay this chicken fat yellow and currant jelly two words are very important these are seen on the microscopic picture and it is related to the post mortem clots then finally uh, fate of thrombus what thrombus will the fate the outcome of thrombi can be like it will be like resolution resolution that means thrombus activates the thrombus will activate the fibrinolytic system by itself and uh, which re it, it releases the plasmin okay the thrombus after activating the fibrinolytic system then a plasmin is released so that this plasmin will resolve the complete thrombus so this is the resolution one fate and the other fate is organization that means the thrombus will exclude from the vascular lumen and it becomes the part of the vessel wall the thrombus will become the part of the vessel wall and it will develop the new blood vessels and the new recanalization blood flow it will develops the new things okay that is called as organization that means it will organize its own blood flow and recanalization example includes the phlebolites here in the organization then the propagation that means that uh, thrombus will enlarge in the size due to more and more deposition of the constant and finally it causes the obstruction of the important vessel and finally the thromboembolism thromboembolism means the thrombi in the early stage and the infected thrombi or quite i mean like they are very fragile and they will get detached from the original site and they will go in detached from the vessel wall and it result in the partial or a complete uh, obstruction of the blood stream such as emboli and hence it is called as a thromboembolism okay in this the thrombus thrombus will get detached okay so this is the fate of thrombus that is resolution organization propagation and thromboembolism so that is that is the thrombus formation and here you have to remember about the differences between the post mortem clot and the anti mortem thrombus and the the patho i mean like predisposing factors of the thrombus formation okay remember one thing there is no elevator to success for every anything okay you have to take the steps that means you have to work hard for anything and along with your hard working just add a smart work also so that you'll succeed okay